Uh, that is why Steve Biko spends so much time on the mind. Because, he, you know, as we, as we know, he says that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the, the mind, mind of, of the, the oppressed. oppressed. Once the oppressor has got your mind, you reproduce oppression without even the supervision of whiteness. On culture. Gululego and Culture, hello and welcome to yet another episode. Thank you very much for joining us, 50,000 subscribers and counting. Thank you for liking, subscribing and commenting on the content as well. Uh, my guest is Uandele uh, Mutama. My leader, thank you very much for joining us. Ngokelie PLF, we content creator. Welcome to the world of creating content. Also joining the willies on the content creation. I saw Uandele Mutama speaks. Uh, that's your podcast now. Um, you already have 4,000 people who are subscribers. Um, how is that journey of content creation? Are you enjoying it? Um, it's something that um, requires a bit of planning, a bit of thinking through what we're doing. Uh, we're shooting 30 uh, minutes episodes for now. And uh, later on, we hope to do what you're doing to invite uh, guests and uh, grow the podcast. Yeah, I love it. I love it because I know like the first time I spoke to you, we were talking about it. And I said to you, like, that's the space you need to go into. Uh, and I'm happy that uh, the guys behind the scenes, Upura Jack, I know he's very involved in that, that he was able to help, um, you know, the creation of the podcast as well. Um, I want to be selfish a bit. We're going to talk a lot, uh, but I would like to be selfish a bit. I am a content creator who um, created it Disky TV with my friend Jason Aker. Um, and then I created Ngulegon Culture here. I've been working with Khalkhelo Sebata. Um, she's been brilliant working with me here. And in the past 10, 12 days, I struggled mentally uh, reflecting on the content that I've done. And the question I've been asking myself, how does this help black people? Um, there's a financial imperative every time we start these things. Um, we want to spread a message out there. We want to be creative. We want to carve out a space for ourselves so that when you have, in two years' time, I'm sure that I will have 200,000 um, subscribers. I am sure of that because I'm a creator in the space. Um, but I've been reflecting on the content itself and I stopped talking about celebrities. Um, we were doing a show where we talked about celebrities. I've stopped that. I would rather speak to the celebrity if I have to than gossiping about celebrities. And I'm never going to do any episode where I'm gossiping about people. So I've been reflecting on myself and challenging myself to do better. I know I haven't given you a chance to think about this, but as a creator, as a how important. I mean, you've already seen when you were with DJ Spoo, you had over 100,000 people watching that. When you were with me, you had over 100,000 people watching this. Um, surely then it means this, is, this these podcasts, the rise of these podcasts um, are influential to our people. With your experience, I've always listened to you. Um, but and I'm going to the microphone. No, sure. Um, <clears throat> in the beginning of the 90s, there was a whole move in the social movements globally to deal with the area of information dissemination. Mm -hmm. In fact, they started a very popular internet-based thing which was called the independent media mm. and their slogan was don't be against the media be the media um <clears throat> because the the battle uh, globally it is ultimately about information <laughs> it's a propaganda war yeah the ruling class puts lots of money billions of money into its media outlets and uh, this way it controls the minds of the people. Those of us who want change <laughs> have to go into that space and to put up a big counter battle, counter propaganda, as uh, some people would say. So with the podcast space now, technology allows for relatively cheap ways to create content which goes against the grain. Of course, the majority of people who are moving into this space are in those in entertainment, creating 
fairly innocuous, sometimes even uh, politically backward, but, but very popular content. Mm. So a few of us who want to move into, if you like, conscious um, content creation, uh, have a, a big platform that we, we, we have to enter. We have to support each other. <laughs> we have to, of course, criticize uh, each other as yeah. well. Um, but we are a community. I mean, uh, Tiki Mazwai, for instance, I really follow what she's doing yeah. there. As DJ Spoo <laughs> and uh, my uh, ideological foe, Penuel the Black Pen. That man makes me so tired. It showed me a um, pen. Oh, man. Um, and then, of course, the big one is uh, Meg Mech Yes. Who, of course, <laughs> uh, is almost mainstream. That is the danger of That's popularity. That's an interesting thing, yeah. That's yes. an interesting observation. Uh, yeah. He's always mainstream, doing exactly the kinds of things that you would have thought that podcasters are going to try to move away to challenge the status quo. He is part of the status quo. Um, and I mean, even some of the political uh, people he got there, <laughs> like uh, the racist DA guy, uh, you know, uh, and the kind of questions are not counter-hegemonic. So we must admit that in the podcast space, you're going to have pro-establishment people as well. In fact, I believe some of the white capital are sponsoring uh, some of these uh, podcast area because white capital or capitalism in general is always thinking ahead. They will see this space as the next big thing. And how do they populate it with their ideas so that they maintain the hegemony? Because, uh, I mean, we are able to create big uh, audiences and alternative people. That is very dangerous to the system. Yeah. So the system is going to contaminate this space with its own people. And it, it will then bring this content, which is backward, but very popular. So we're going to have a battle again, intra the podcast uh, space to carve out <laughs> some kind of a uh, possibility for, I think in another two years, we'll be able to say which podcasts are counter hegemonic, are progressive, are for some kind of opening of minds mm. and which ones are contributing to us sleeping, making our people to sleep, basically. Yeah, yeah. I think you mentioned something very interesting about the, the system. You always say this as well. Uh, the system is always ahead. Um, the capitalistic system is always ahead and always thinking of ways um, to counter the counter. Um, I was speaking to someone um, who gave us the first deal at ETSK TV, the World Sports Betting that you see across. And the someone knows that I'm, I've now become an industry expert, particularly on at least YouTube. And they were so excited with what I'm doing because the rate at which it was growing was very rapid. Uh, that in three or four months, it got like 40,000 subscribers. And when they went to the office, um, they were going to give me a deal, right? And then when they went to the office, when they came back, and it was not World Sports Betting, he had moved to somewhere else. He came back and he said, um, these are the concerns that we have with the content. Um, and he, he mentioned the fact that I spoke to people who are working in the sex industry. Um, you speak to politicians. And this, that was the discomfort for their brand, that money was there and the channel was going to be helped. And I have the networks because of ETSK, you know, but... Um, they couldn't. And I was not heartbroken, but I was like concerned. I'm like, hmm, okay, but I'm not going to change what I'm doing, right? But this means that I, I now have to understand my predicament that it is key. football really lulls the masses. Uh, and you've said this, like it's really entertainment for people just to keep going and keep going until you pass away. And then the next generation keep going, like entertain you on the weekend to prepare you for a Monday to Friday and then come back again, recreate the cycle. 
Uh, that's what football fulfills. Of course, it helps us in that moment to escape. It's like ther- therapy, but it's also part of the system. It helps you move from one year to the next. That's why it's, it's season after season, and there's never a gap in between seasons. It's like a movie that doesn't end. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's a season in yeah. 1990 where there was Machens Mutale, and then there's a season in 2014 where there's Teko Mudise. It's like there's new stars yeah. created every year, right? Uh, but I digress. I think what I'm trying to say is that... Um, the corporates are now, like, uh, to your point, the corporates are now understanding their power in the podcasting space and they will nudge us uh, towards, like, if you wanted to sponsor yourself, you you would struggle to get it unless it's a black businessman who is pro-black um, because the corporates are nudging us towards a direction where we speak entertainment and football um, and not speak counter-messages against the system. Yeah, no... <clears throat> It is like uh, capitalism is dynamic. It always changes. There was a time capitalism was factory-based. It's no longer that. It is now more based on creativity, basically. The intellectual uh, property is the most important uh, commodity for sale, for instance. Um, Capitalism went into the factory, went into the cottage, now capitalism wants to work without the responsibility <clears throat> of taking care of workers. Mm. So you create this platform, you work from home, great for capitalism, does not have to worry about overheads and that kind of thing. It will just create uh, some kind of a deal with you and it gets its cut. It will do the same with whoever is in the space. But the downside of that is that we end up our message is being tailored once more to reproduce the same system which we believe has caused all the problems that we have. So it's a, a dangerous space, in a sense, time also, where there are possibilities to create something that can empower people seriously in terms of how we think, how we understand the world, and how we can change the world. But the danger is also that we can be captured <laughs> by money. Mm. And um, we will do the work of capitalism with very little investment they do on us. They'll give us a little bit, will m- basically create the same messaging system that they have in the past have to put billions of rands into now with very little. And they will promote some of us, will become superstars. Yeah. Make a little bit money for ourselves, but the, the revolutionary potential of this platform of this new possibility will be completely subverted. Mm. So that is the danger. There's a big opportunity right now because we are independent. We can almost say whatever we want. Mm. But that space, as I say, with time, money will come <laughs> and money will control. And we will be doing the work of mainstream media. Mm. In, independently, we'll call ourselves independent, but reproducing the same ideology of the mainstream. Yeah, and the other problem that we have is that a lot of these podcasts, all of that, all of them, um, they are produced by people who are generally middle class, if there is such a thing. Uh, kids who went to private or model schools. Um, who are not pro-black, like their way of thinking. Because, of course, if we, the education system, I think, trains us into a capitalistic white way of thinking, and we then have those sensitivities. And that's why we can have conversations. Like, I'm so uncomfortable. I saw Rob, so we'll get to him, uh, doing a media run, and I was like, there's no way. I, I, I can't. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. Uh, like... Yeah. Nabanya Nabanya Johnston Hazen, for example, Nay and Naklabana, I know after four, I'm like, it's like, yo, Bang and Nolan and Ababanda, Naklabana, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I think, um, my other concern, and I've been saying this, is that it's it's a lot of this, and there's a problem that we need to reverse as well. Uh, and I know township kids would rather buy bread and milk than buy microphones because they're not in a position to be able to do that. And as a result of that, because of the inequalities of the country, we are finding that these podcasts are now being delivered by black kids who have a white lived experience. Um, that uh, goes to what uh, uh, Gogo uh, Obrima Chika said. Yes. 
that we have a situation in South Africa where we are a numerical majority but a cultural minority. Yes. Now the the people whose culture makes sense or whose culture is uh, mainstream is the middle class and white. So <laughs> the white system has created its deputy whites from our children. We take to white schools, white universities, and uh, the cultural space, the formal cultural space is saturated by whiteness. And so what is going to happen is that the cultural domination and its reproduction is going to be driven by these black middle class children and um, black middle class platforms, which would, of course, recruit a little bit from the working class because the working class always looks in enviously to this uh, world which is created by the middle classes, which approximates whiteness. And that is the hegemony of ideas, which of course reproduces whiteness, which of course means that we're never going to be able to create the kind of momentum to create a counter-hegemonic ideological uh, mm -hmm. edifice. This is the <laughs> big struggle, my brother. White capital is reproducing itself through black bodies, through black voices, mm -hmm. through black representation, in a sense. I mean, look, uh, UK, they have a... a, a Oh yeah, a, a I saw this new white. Barack, Barack yes. Obama. <laughs> yes, He's I mean, that Asian is... Asian descent. Yes, right? yes. White capital, white supremacy in the 21st century uh, needs a little bit of melanin to reproduce itself. So these spaces are going to be whitened and they become dangerous to the white, to the black project mm -hmm. and they're going to reproduce the, the white project. And I mean, that is part of the contestation that we must have. Mm -hmm. Those of us who have the different views must insert ourselves into this space so that somehow we counter the uh, hegemony of views which are anti-black. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm curious about the masses though and whether or not there is, I don't know how to ask this question, but I'm thinking about the masses and the fact that they always somehow find themselves in a places where they will be slaughtered, but they don't realize it. Like, they never realize it. Like, for me, I would think that, but of course I understand that there must be a process of re-education and reversing the white education that we receive, but I would see it when something is it's like, yo, this thing, this platform. No, I, would, I wouldn't. I so would so, so what we need is... A layer that of the black middle class yeah. that refuses to sell out. <laughs> that is the only way we can maintain the interests of the base, which is black, which does not speak on the, in these platforms. But when we speak, we represent we those of us who want the real change, represent that uh, excluded mass in these spaces. Um, if we don't do that, then the hegemony of the right wing, I mean, listening to Penuel, my friend, he's a reproduction of right wing ideas. Uh, and he's so popular. And the black middle class uh, finds resonance with these right wing anti-black ideas, which present themselves as wisdom sometimes, you know, uh, about how you can get out of poverty and all that, this kind of thing. But all of it, of course, uh, absolving the structures that reproduce poverty, exclusion, and oppression. Um, but it becomes normalized and in a very accessible discourse that explains the world in ways which basically exclude the majority of our people and not only that but also blame them for their circumstances yeah i think uh, you, you hit the nail on the head there panel is a good friend of mine i like him as a person he's a very nice decent gentleman and, I, and very clever too yeah, yeah yeah and i was with him uh last week thursday he was helping me as i was going through my mental things and we're, we're just talking and i said to you you have problematic politics and every time we, we record together, we call each other out on that. I'm like, you have problematic politics. What What's wrong with you and the Afro Forum? Like, what, what, what message are you trying to convey there? But I think I'm picking up what you're saying now, that somehow we get blamed for the hegemony and the colonialism that was imposed on us by the Europeans. Because through the language, um, there's a language of 
a, a weaker race or men defending their women. You know, the way that it's positioned is like, um, you know, the, only the strong survive and white people conquered. And that's his language. I love him. Like, I really, really love Penwell. But we, we disagree on those things. And that's the language. Like, yo, uh, ultimately, if we have enough of those messages and enough of those Penwells, in 10 years' time, kids will believe that our people were weak and that's why they were conquered and it's 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 open season to go and conquer other people it's like they would think that they could in order for them to reclaim their glorious africanness they the thing is for them to go to zimbabwe and go and conquer that world and then dance on top of those graves and say we conquered you you know and i think that that's the problem i have it's like yo you just want to black people to be blamed for being decent human beings who allowed col um, colonizers in our, in, a, in, in our land and then eventually they took our land and they created laws to, to, to make it unlawful to be black in our own land. I mean, this is the guy who says Afriforum does all this great work, is going to give them money and then turn around and says, I will never die for black people and mentions our martyrs, people who died in the quest for our freedom. And as, as if it is useless deaths, that they, they died, nobody, Steve Biko, he even mentioned that. I mean, this kind of reducing of black suffering, of black efforts, and uh, removing the white system from responsibility. Yeah, absorbing of, of responsibility. Exactly. It is part of this uh, new wisdom uh, that passes as wisdom, these ideas that... We, of course, it, it's all conservative, racist, meritocracy, meritocracy, meritocracy. That, that those ideas of individualism, which don't operate uh, within the black space within the African uh, cosmology, but I mean, for me, what ultimately they do is to absorb whiteness from responsibility. Yeah. I mean, how can you today go with AfriForum? AfriForum is a racist organization. It is clear in its own constitution that it's there to perpetuate Africana interests. And uh, it has put money to appeal cases of white farmers who murder black people many times. And uh, when they go to the appeal courts, they get those white people out. And of course, they play a game of you know, Senzo Meiwa here or some other black com community struggling there to legitimize themselves. But their project is to perpetuate Africanadom. Mm. And Africanadom in this way, it is of course white supremacy. It is what they have done with uh, Orania, what they're trying to do with the Western Cape and what they have done in the social and political and economic situation where Africana interest trump any other interest i mean this is racist project how can you associate yourself with that instead of arguing for its destruction so that we can have real black liberation mm -hmm. then you blame black people to say they are doing nothing uh, Af afri forum is doing something but it's doing something on the basis of oppression and its capacity to do so it is out of apartheid uh, empowerment that's, that's what is happening there. Um, so all I'm saying is that the hegemony of anti-blackness is now perpetuated by black bodies. Mm -hmm. Can I just perhaps interject there, to, even to our people who are watching now, that I did say this at some point in the few episodes. I said, Penwell never raised his hand to be a leader. When I saw him, I saw a content creator. I saw someone who looks like me who talks like me, who has backward ideas which we can work out and trash out and debate. He can win the debate, I can win the debate, doesn't matter. But I never, it never occurred to me, and this is the thing going back to the masses, it never occurred to me that that's my leader. Yes, he's got a platform, he speaks, um, but I, I, I see him as a content creator. Why is it that our people always want to latch on to leaders? You don't vet them, you don't know where he comes from, you don't know who fed, clothed him. You know, he's a good friend of mine. I love Penn. But he is he's a leader. A but he, he is a leader. But who, from, who's making him a leader? Uh, the people that he has converted by, in a sense, calibrating the conservative 
sentiment in society, anti-blackness is managing to um, capitalize on anti-blackness and uh, creating a big audience that find resonance with his message. Ideologically, he's a serious leader because he's leading a whole layer of people who are constantly going into anti-black positionalities and that perpetuate, in a sense, the system of whiteness. Um, he, he, he is a conservative leader. Are you not overestimating his importance to our people? Because I'm still maintaining that he's a content creator. Content creators are very powerful individuals in society yeah. because you guys control ideas. And uh, if, as we believe, ideas are what determines what happens, ideas becomes the most important arena for contestation yeah. and for creating reality, for even politicization or even making people make choices. If you create many panels like this, our people, when it comes to voting, they will simply vote a white party. They will have no qualms about doing that because ideologically they will be converted into white thinking. So it is a very, very dangerous a space that must be uh, countered with uh, counter narratives of black revolutionary thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is not um, an insignificant area. I think it's a very, very important area. And Penuel is one of the leaders of this anti-black project, which if it grips the majority, they will become autopilot presenters of whiteness. Whiteness will not need they to be there. They wouldn't need to be in the country even. Exactly. We will simply reproduce the white project uh, white interest and blame black people for all the sins of whiteness because that is the ultimate project that of Penwell and people like Kanye West is to blame the victims of the white system and say you are the problem you must you can make it the system is not the problem yeah. the problem is you um, and and imagine what it does in fact to the black psyche. Because at some point, black people are going to have to c account for why is it not that we are excluded? Is it our personal failing? Yeah. Because this is what they're driving this The personal to. deficiency. You, you, exactly. You, you are not motivated <laughs> enough to go out there and make it in industry. You are lazy. And that's why foreigners are taking this and this and this. Exactly. You're trivializing the message of taking and coloniality to just at an individual level. You're not motivated enough, you're lazy, you're not educated, whereas it's a bigger fundamental systematic problem. But I will still want to push back on you, my leader, that um, we, we, are, we, are, we are overrating the importance of panel. I understand what you're saying from a perspective of an adult who emerges, who's given a microphone, and he, his ideas spread to the people of Germany, right? And they buy into this idea. So you, you, you get that people rise through that and other examples we could use that you give someone a microphone they convince people um and they become leaders they can become elevated but still but what makes us as black people listen to and say hmm leader let me go there why don't we don't but, but, uh, why is he saying the things that he's saying where does it come from part of the oppressive experience being oppressed as a people it is precisely the attack on the thinking capacity if you like yeah uh, that is why steve because spends so much time on the mind because he, you know as we as we know he says that the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the, the mind, mind of, of the oppressed. oppressed now once the oppressor has got your mind you reproduce oppression without even the supervision of white of whiteness and and that is why i think you underestimating the damage projects such as penwell mcg as well um, and many others such as those has on the psyche of black people mm -hmm. i think we must not underestimate any conservative moves um, which seek to blame black people normalize whiteness mm -hmm. Um, and 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 if these uh, mushroom as the as the word, 
we're going to be confronted with this possibility where black people keep on shooting themselves in the foot without even knowing so. Because as Rob Herzog does, they plug into how we respond to situations. Mm. Knowing that we are programmed against ourselves, it is simply easy to say the problem I'm a and indeed, because we are competing with them for jobs, and the whole thinking process of the right wing, of the new right, even including my friend Gaten McKenzie, is one of a job instead of thinking about we own this country, we own the economy. Yeah. So we are competing for jobs with people from outside of the country, and that becomes the focal point of our energy and our battle. And, and I, I believe that it is part of the creation of the white system which is perpetuated by this conservative black thinking and people like pen will play a big role there so i i don't think we must underestimate mm. how dangerous the right wing is and how when it gets hegemony in ideas area because for me the podcasting area is where ideas are generated when they get hegemony a right wing hegemony there they're going to be driving the whole community, the whole society towards a right-wing possibility. Yeah. I think the other interesting as, the thing as well to us, the audience, is that, and I want to put it out there, that right-wing white Africaners have their own platforms on YouTube. And noticeably, they never have black guests. Um, I've listened to a few, uh, sometimes involuntarily, someone will send me a link, and I, I, I listen to their... They speak to the Nationalist Party leaders or um, the liberal leaders of the 1980s, 1970s, and you see the way that they, they, they convey their history uh, to show um, an, a side of it that is absorbing them, absorbing them of any responsibility of um, the unlawful nature of what they were doing during the apartheid. Um, to them, it's like it was a battle of ideas and we won. Um, you know, so there is no responsibility for us. That's maybe the message I'm trying to put out there that uh, those of us who are black, who are in the spaces that are in podcasting, there is no responsibility for us to have these people. Um, they already have their spaces. And you will see that the audience is exclusively Africans. Um, and the way that they talk about history is so glowing. And it's like you just get a, like you have an opportunity to look through the window like, oh, these people think like that. These people still think that this is their country and so on and so forth. And there is no responsibility for us. Because I think, Tina, because of our training into whiteness, we still have, have this thing of let's invite Afroforum to go and sit here. Afroforum has its own platforms with its own uh, base uh, and they consume their content. And there is no responsibility for us who are black if we are trying to help black people to be, to be, to, to, to be speaking on behalf of white people. You, you see, um, the only group that has a clear agenda in this country is white people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they have a very clear agenda and uh, they are represented and they are spreading themselves uh, across the space. If you come to our black spaces, you'll find heads of the... Um, then they have their own exclusive spaces where they really work themselves ideologically to absolve whiteness, to pr present intelligent sounding arguments yeah. uh, around why the problem is the ANC and the corruption of Absolute. the ANC. Absolutely. Absolute. That's what they're teaching. That's their biggest um, propaganda project um, within the white children who are following that content that all you need to know is that we gave these people power and their problem is corruption. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. And this corruption thing is a very powerful tool. And of course, I mean, it disempowers ourselves as well. The ANC is corrupt. The ANC is... And its corruption is a... It's a very bad kind of corruption. They must go to jail for their bad corruption, in fact, <laughs> even not for corruption. Yeah. Because they're not even stealing real money. I mean, they are go for tenders and compete with uh, subcontractors in these RDP projects, killing each other there, that kind of thing. Um, 
But this is the, the real challenge. The ANC's uh, corruption, the ANC's incompetence, the ANC's neglect of our people is creating an alibi for whiteness yeah. and for white racism. And therefore, it is easy for us all to be united against the ANC, even with land thieves, the original criminals. They will be talking about the corruption of the ANC, which is palpable, which they also, if you like, magnify. I mean, there's little talk of um, Marcus Juste, for instance, mm. the biggest, biggest corrupt person in this country. <laughs> this is the most corrupt individual in this country. They've just produced a documentary about him. Yes. I mean, um, so, of course, they will, they will show his brilliance and all that goes with that. Yeah. And then... Yeah, because they were, they were showing all the aspects of him. He was a brilliant accountant. Uh, and then someone else says uh, he had an insatiable desire for greed or something like that. But they will, they will give you all the angles to him. They yeah. will humanize him. Yeah. And not at, the, at the end, they will personalize it as a Marcus just a problem mm. of corruption. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's important. Yes. It is not the problem of white corruption. This is it's not how uh, Stellenbosch reproduces its wealth, maintains its wealth through corrupt means. But the corruption is for black people. Black politicians and some black, uh, you know, business people. I mean, if you are not brought up by them, such as Patrice Mutsipe, you know how Rob uh, Herzog speaks about how yeah. his family have brought, he's almost claiming that they own him. And he says he must reject the ANC, he must stop funding the ANC. This is how he'll become a real great hero. Basically reminding him that they have created him. They have created this black capitalist. And that's why there's no black capitalism in this country, quite frankly. We have junior partners of real capital. If you are a black capitalist, you cannot be independent. They will come for you. They will destroy you. We've seen how, what they did with the Guptas, uh, who were supposedly part of the capitalist class. But uh, they were decimated. As soon as they turn against white capital, they were decimated. No black capital is going to support a counter-hegemonic project against whiteness in this country. Nobody's going to give money to BLF, for instance. Uh, if, you, if you try to do so, they'll, they'll destroy you very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, you, you spent a lot of time talking about Rob Herzog um, in the lead-up to you shooting a video about him, and that was very popular. Um, you gave a very detailed meditation on him, where he comes from, um, his family background, um, his alleged crimes um, against, I think, his employees or whatever the case is. Um, and I quite enjoyed that that because what I had seen in the lead up to that, that he went to MACG, he went to SABC, went to Penwell, um, and there is a relationship with Penwell, um, you know, and if you look at it with the SABC uh, interview, I think it got 300,000 views and then with the MACG, because of the big audience, I think it got over half a million views. With the panel show, it got over 100,000 views. So and for me... it was in Biz News as well. Oh, it was on... Okay, right. So like I could see that there's a media run being done here. Um, and I remember that I had, I had been consuming information uh, that revealed that Bill Gates was frowned upon by the American public in the 1990s because they suddenly found out that the viruses he was creating for his own Microsoft was deliberate so that you can then subscribe to the antivirus. And sometimes I, was, I saw a video of people uh, throwing pie on his face. He was a hated personality. And then um, empirically, they proved that in the 2000s, somewhere between 20, 2000 and 2010, they spent, oh, he spent over 300 million US dollars um, on media campaigns on different channels to pacify his image. And that's how he becomes this big, they position him as a big philanthropist who's going to India on a philanthropy project. But then activists in India reveals that um, there are children who are being experimented on um, with his, um, uh, um, what is this, vaccines. And he becomes this philanthropist, but now after COVID, I think his popularity goes down again. People start to see him as this evil person because it's like, yo, you're not a doctor. Why are you telling us about COVID? What's wrong with you? And we start becoming suspicious of him. So I looked at Rob and I was like, there is a reason why he's doing the things that he's doing. I'm terrified of him. 
um, you put it in words as to what should we be careful of with regards to a character like that. You, to, you, you said he's an activist capitalist. You termed it uh, as an activist capitalist, something like that. Yeah, I mean, this guy is, is bad news in a serious, serious way. And uh, you see, he has figured out how black people think. And uh, he has figured out how easy it is to buy black leadership. But he also understands the power of propaganda. That is why he goes into these media spaces. And there, he's doing two things, really. Pushing hard on the ANC's corruption and incompetence and then mobilizing the anti-immigrant sentiment. Mm. If you like, all the organized anti-immigrant groups, whether it's the PA of Gaitin McKenzie or Nklantalax, uh, Rob is at the center. He understands that black people are so uh, are economically depressed that any excuse that is directed against other black people will become the most effective mechanism to divert attention away from Stellenbosch and white monopoly capital. And I, I mean, I'm saying this is his most important project to divert our attention away from white uh, guilt, white um, needing to pay reparations, uh, white controlling the economy still, whites undermining the Immigration Act by employing people from outside South Africa instead of South Africans. But then turning the attention away from that and then we are focused on the black. We are focusing on the black immigrant. We are focusing on the black corrupt politician. And uh, move from, from view is Stellenbosch, which control the country, control the economy, which control what's going on even in parliament. So that is the genius of Rob Herzog. And uh, I'm saying to you, he understands the black psyche and he understands how easy it is to buy black leadership. And he has moved into that space. And also he understands the power of propaganda where he presents himself as a militant, as, a, as I say, capitalist activist mm -hmm. against corruption. Because, I mean, that is his biggest kind of, you know, uh, stick. He's fighting corruption. He wants a functioning government. Uh, but look already. He, he's very corrupt himself, already found guilty in, in Germany and so on. Not only that, he's going to government demanding airports. I mean, he doesn't want any processes which is open tender, as they would claim. He simply says to government, I want this airport and that airport, sell it to me. Um, and when government, for whatever reason, said no, he got even more anti-ANC. I think what triggered him is precisely when the ANC did not give him those airports. Mm. Ultimately, what is his um, ambition? Because I actually heard him break down the possibilities of 2024. And I said to myself, this sounds like a man who... <laughs> If I've never heard a puppet master, I am hearing a puppet master now. Because the way that he was breaking down the possibilities of 2024 um, sounded like a person who is a, a ventriloquist. Um, yeah. What do you think? What do you preempt from him? Because even, and it's so important to have people like you here, because I was internalizing even the the push towards coalition government. And it's like, Anytime our vision coincides with the vision of the enemy, something is wrong. Like, yeah. if we start speaking about coalition government, which I think we're going there because of the negative sentiment towards the ANC with the obvious corruption, uh, how is it that we as black people are speaking the same language as he's speaking because he's also pushing for coalition? What's in it for him? What's in it for us? If we go into coalition governments, for example. Yeah, I mean... Um he has what I call the Herzog Plan 2024. Yes, yes. Um, he has his cabinet, for instance, a desired cabinet. Um, and in that political arrangement, there will be no ANC. He mentions all these other political parties, which he will fund. 
and they will have a big impact in the coming elections. And once he funds them, it means he controls them. So you're going to have a parliament which is controlled by Rob Herzog, basically, in 2024. Um, and his agenda, really, it is to maintain the white supremacist project as far as it's articulated in the economy and to make even more money for himself through controlling the means of production. I mean, he's a capitalist. He's driven by the profit, profit motive. But in South Africa, politics interfere with the economy. That's why we talk about black economic empowerment yeah. and that goes with that. He will be able to shut down all that. Already, I mean, with uh, under Ramaphosa, white capital is controlling stuff. But they think he's weak. That's why they want him out. Mm. They think he's unable to check Zuma. They, I mean, he has not been able to shut Zuma out completely. Zuma is still very popular, as uh, we all can see. And he is still playing in the political space. They, the white capital want somebody who's going to shut down that radical economic transformation project completely. And that can be done politically by bringing a government which is not ANC, which is controlled by the DA ideologically um, and funded by um, funded, controlled, coached, policy-wise, driven by Herzog. So this is the, <laughs> it's going to be the father of South African politics, if you like. Um, and, and, and he is making himself known um, and black people start liking him. You know, I mean, yeah, just, just, like, no, just, yeah. just like what I say about sure. what they've done with, uh, um, you know, Johan Rupert uh, forming a soccer form, uh, buying a soccer team. Stellan Bosch FC. Yes. Black <laughs> people are supporters of that team. White people are doing it when win the hearts and minds of black people towards a white project. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's seen something with podcasts. I think, yes. I think he... I, I I remember four months ago before he w was on this run, I saw him somewhere. That's when I I was repulsed by even the aggression, because uh, usually capitalists and puppet masters are always in the background. They give us the impression that we run things. He was so aggressive, and I remember he said something to the effect of not minding to see even uh, a government that has uh, personalities like Mac G in it, and I'm like. Where yeah. is this coming from? Yeah. And that was four months before he went on the run, on yeah. his run that is currently yeah. on now. And then from that, you can understand why he's making the moves he's making on the podcasting space. Yeah. The, 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 the ruling class, anyway, it perpetuates itself through the consent of the ruled. And you get consent by basically controlling what, or even creating stuff that the ruled love. Like now, you know, with soccer, despite it, I mean, already we know traditionally it is there to pacify us. But now they go, these white capitals of Stellenbosch, at a time we're fighting Stellenbosch, they call the soccer team Stellenbosch. <laughs> I mean, conceptually what that does to your own thinking, I mean, you are agitated against this thing, but now you love Stellenbosch, mm -hmm. normalizing Stellenbosch. They are playing in the idea, in the arena of ideas in a very serious way where we are checkmated as black people. Yeah. And again, you know, uh, we end up in this autopilot of saving white interests. And I, and, I, and I believe that Rob Herzog understands the arena of ideas. And he is also sending himself as a symbol of these new possibilities, which is not corrupt, which is efficient, which is going to serve the economy. Of course, that means saving him. Yeah. And then maybe we'll get some jobs somewhere. But his project is going to triumph in 2024. And then I think that will take us back another 50 years. Yeah. That's why it's so terrifying. Do you care to consider whether or not Johan Rupert or... Oppenheimer has anything to do with it? Is he is he trying to outclass them? I know it's an, a very irrelevant question because ultimately we have puppet masters and they're ruling over us. Uh, but do you think he's trying to outsmart them or they are together? I think he's impatient. He is impatient with them, in a sense that he and he also understands that the Oppenheimers, the way they've 
uh, presented themselves, they'll never pronounce on political matters. Yeah. They will never enter into the public arena and, and get into spats and so on. Uh, Johan Rupert occasionally does, but also he, he he's um, a conservative, if you like, a capitalist. This guy is out there. He's fighting openly the capitalist project and legitimizing it as well. I mean, and that's where I think the danger comes, where he speaks with so much legitimacy mm. and he is able to chop our dissatisfaction, package it and present it in such a way that in fact, whilst it looks like it's saving our interest, it's undercutting our interest, in fact. Um, so that is where his genius is, where he's calibrating our dissatisfaction with the ANC. Yeah. Back to creating power of whiteness to sustain itself. His project is not going to deliver black people. What his project is going to do is to entrench whiteness and to postpone even further for many, much, many years the project of black liberation. Um, and that is why I find him so dangerous because he is doing it through the medium of ideas mm -hmm. where he is in a sense, convincing black people towards his perspective. And a perspective which, as I say, is very clever because it hits on the ANC, it hits on anti-blackness. Our sentiment of hating ourselves is being packaged very nicely to make sure that white capital is perpetuated. Um, we are not talking about Stellenbosch. Wherever he is, where, when he talks, it is the ANC, it is the illegal immigrant. And it is true, our people are dissatisfied with the ANC and are competing with the illegal immigrant. And, and that presents a material force for a political project which is anti-black. Mm. No, no possibility of any reversal of the project 2024. Like the, you, can you offer us any alternative? Because it does look like we are... Uh, uh, going down a cliff or and uh, it's not it's, it doesn't seem as though there's something we can do about it you know my brother the immediate possibility is if EFF and ANC were to <laughs> present that change mm. but they themselves are controlled by the same forces so Stellenbosch has all the cards, my friend. The possible alternative is already captured. And they are creating a new force which presents so-called new possibility, which is not new at all, which will be the same system of white domination. <laughs> I don't know, man. It looks like Stellenbosch is going to win in 2024, whether AEFF and the ANC go together, yeah. because that would have been the, the acoustics of that suggests um, a counter. You know, EFF and ANC together, they're supposed to be against white capital. Sure. Uh, but as I say, mm. both projects. So, Rob Herzog has all the cards, my friend. Uh, so, 2024. However, the mutation of the political uh, groups, the agenda is going to be the agenda of Stellenbosch. Yeah. Does it matter what happens in Nazrek? Well, it does matter. It does matter. Um, Nazrek could be our saving grace <laughs> if the Zuma faction emerges. Now... We are in the realm of propaganda and ideas, as you said, and I agree with you. Um, the Zuma faction already, the media is going to be on overdrive uh, to attack it to a point where ANC outright loses. Uh, that's, that's, you won't even, the DA or the EFF won't even need to spend a cent uh, on radio and television. Uh, Exactly the, 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 the circumstances that led to President Jacob Zuma stepping down on that night that he stepped down, 
you know, there was so much pressure. It's as if, if it doesn't step down tonight, the country will blow up tomorrow. And that was the build up to it was uh, the media frenzy. Um, every single Sunday newspaper was always about Gupta and Zuma. And even you even touched on this, even the Gupta um, and the Zupta and how it was coined and how it was used and weaponized. So it could be a saving grace ideologically, but I, I'm, I'm posing uh, a different scenario to say that if that happens, right, uh, that the machine that was mobilized to, le- to make uh, Jacob Zuma step down in the first place is going to be restarted and it's going to be re-energized and it might be even 10 times more. So that the narrative is that because you, uh, you, you, you re-elected a Zuma proxy or President Jacob Zuma himself, um, you lost the election. You lost the election outright so bad. It is true. Um, white capital mobilized a billion rand to just buy the ANC conference yeah. against Zuma. Now, if Zuma was to emerge, his faction was to emerge, they will double that, put it into the opposition parties. Not only that, Crack the ANC. They will then say to Ramaphosa when he loses the ANC conference, form a party, which will take a chunk of the vote together with the EFF and the DA. They'll be able to form a government. So, in a sense, the emergence of the if the Zuma faction was to emerge, <laughs> it's going to creates a serious rift which can only mean that for the left to emerge it will have to plug with the masses in ways that it isn't right now um, that Zuma popularity will have to be doubled um, the messaging of what is happening must be, will have to be much clearer and given the fact that white media is going to control the messaging absolutely is going to make that project very very difficult they will double down double down but i don't think it's impossible i i think let's look at what's happening in brazil for instance yeah uh, lula is coming back i mean the in other elections will run now end of uh, of uh, this month Oh, yeah, because he, he won, but he didn't win by an outright majority, yes. so there's going to be a run of election. Yes. But he, he, I think he got 40-something percent. Yeah, he yeah, he got uh, higher than the other Against, guy. Against uh, Bolsonaro. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Actually. Yes. I mean, I, I, interesting because it almost uh, parallels what happened in South Africa with, you know, Lula going to jail for corruption and all that goes with that. Just like uh, here, Zuma goes to jail and and all that. I believe Lula and Zuma have the similar kinds of popularity. Mm. And um, if there was an... See, the problem of the RET forces and Zuma, they are not fighting. You see, they are, there's no clear battle. I mean, only now with his last uh, press conference did he go against Ramaphosa. But there's no clear battle, there's no plan, there's no mobilization, there's no visioning, mm. there's no strategizing, there's no mobilization. I mean, how can you dislodge capital, which is such a highly res- resourced uh, enemy, fighting so reluctantly, yeah. so um, disorganized? I mean, mm. they're also divided. I mean, Ace want to be president, the other guy wants to be president, and so on. So there is no cohesive response from the RET forces. Yeah. So who, who is the who is like if you say Ace wants to be president, um, and Dr. Zolim Kiza wants to be president, uh, and Gosazana, and also okay. So the obvious one who is linked with uh, Jacob Zuma is Gosazana Lamini Zuma. Dr. Gosazana Lamini Zuma. Um, so that would would that be the candidate that the Zuma faction mobilizes behind? It will be, but I don't think that candidate uh, deserves it. And, uh, and that is what is going to be a big disadvantage. Because Zana Zuma has not shown over the years. I don't remember a speech where she's fighting. Exactly. I mean, she has been in that cabinet. She's saving Ramaphosa. Yeah. And uh, she's been used even during the COVID uh, time 
to make those unpopular decisions. She has lost a lot of support from our people. Um, so, again, it shows just how disorganized and strategic the radical economic transformation faction is because it's presenting these kind of um, candidates which are compromised which have not put up a fight, which will not even put a fight after we give them power. Mm. This is the thing that uh, frustrates me the most. This bunch of radical economic transformation leaders don't give me the confidence that they are ready to fight and to take this battle to its logical conclusion. Is there a possibility that President Jacob Zuma could raise his hand himself? Because he was asked in the press conference, and I think he, he alluded to the branches that it's up to the branches to select. To Actually, to tell the truth, he's the only possibility that can push us towards a realization of significantly the radical economic transformation agenda. Unfortunately, he's the only candidate that has the balls, that has the vision, yeah. that has the determination to take us a little bit further. So I would be I, I would say the RET forces put Zuma up. What do you think of the case that NPC, the newly elected one, um automatically or immediately showing that their allegiance is with um the president of the ANC and not uh, Zuma? Because the way that they, they make pronouncements and the statements, um I think they made a statement uh against what President Zuma was saying, from President Jacob Zuma was saying on Saturday. Um, and even initially when they were elected, uh, the idea behind electing them, of if people thought that they were going to be with the Zuma faction, within 24 or 48 hours, they announced that they are supportive of the current president, which is pre uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa. What did you think of that? I think that that leadership uh, wavers. I don't think it can be trusted. However, the province itself... I believe it, it is behind President Zuma. So President Zuma can get votes in that conference from the delegates uh, without the 10 PEC members' support. <laughs> um, because, as we say, I, I don't, I, they don't give me the confidence. Uh, they speak uh, with uh, forked tongues. Uh, they sometimes lean towards Zuma for popularity, but in terms of how they act, they are going to more and more closer to Ramaphosa. So it's a very uh, worrying development that KwaZulu Natal is supposed to be much more aggressive, uh, representing radical economic transformation and presenting President Zuma as the alternative. Um, that's not what I see. I think that province is going to be very divided. Um, which can be good, it will neutralize the uh, Ramaphosa faction and hopefully other provinces come through and uh, the Zuma faction emerges. The, the, if they win in December, they still have even a bigger hurdle for the elections. You are right. Yeah, for sure. I think that the system will double down and they will make him... The, if he had a shower on his head when Zapiro was drawing him, he might as well prepare drawing him with a fork and, and make him red. Yeah. And he's going to be the devil incarnate. The system is going to double down if uh, there's any possibility of him winning. Of course, there are podcasts. and uh, Yeah, and I mean, they, they, it's going to be an all and all, all out war. Yeah. Corruption will be put up. Zuma is corrupt. And the, the Guptas are coming back. Uh, they're going to really do that the uh, story, you know, the the Swart Khafar, yeah. that the boogeyman of uh, black uh, uh, danger. Um, the country, they're going to present a scenario where a country is going to go to hell if this Zuma sure. reemerges. And they're going to, they already have these platforms. I think these platforms are, will be used, including independent podcasters, will be funded, will get a lot of money to push that propaganda. It's going to be an outright war against the Zuma faction. There's no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Where does this put uh, an individual like David Mabuza? We know he's a deputy president and he probably was a kingmaker of uh, 2017 um, 
in that. Uh, David who? Uh, the Black Cat. <laughs> no, that man is no longer relevant in our politics. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, no, I no. did read something to that effect. No, he's uh, no longer relevant to our politics. Uh, yeah. He he has squandered uh, whatever you know support he has, even his own uh, province does Pumalanga. not. Yeah, Pumalanga does not listen to him. Does not take him seriously. Um, I don't know uh, what his future is. I don't think he's going to feature anyway post the uh, conference of the ANC. Yeah, when you look at the alignment of the coalition, uh, you did a video on Julius Malema, which I really enjoyed. Um, you're a thorough content creator now. It's like people are going to forget that you're the leader of the PLF. Uh, and um, you mentioned something about the possibility of him being a deputy president of South Africa if the DA coalition wins and John Stinhazen is a president who will become a white president of South Africa. A lot of ifs and buts, but um, what role do you think he plays in 2024? Yeah, I mean, the Rob Herzog plan 2024 um is um, dependent on uh, Julius gelling with the DA because that would give them an outright majority and they'll form a government which will be dominated by the DA of course and then in this way Julius Malema will become the deputy president that is that is the most um realistic possibility for him to become deputy president if he goes with the DA and uh, John becomes the president of the nation. Uh, Julius is not um, aggrieved by that possibility because we know already he has been, they've been uh, imp- kind of experimenting with this model in the, um, in the metros where they give the DA political power um, of course, now there's re-articulation of it. And of course, they are working with the ANC, I think, here in uh, Johannesburg. Uh, the Joburg um, situation where EFF and the ANC are moving together. Yeah. Um, again, that might be the precursor for what's going to happen in 2024. Th- that possibility remains open. Uh, however... London and Stellenbosch can determine that it is DAEFF because London and Stellenbosch controls ultimately what happens in South African politics. Mm. There's no possibility of uh, the influence of him going pro-left and uh, taking his votes, his 10, 15% and creating a leftist possibility. I mean, you were there and you spoke about, uh, on your video, you spoke about the fact that you tried to influence, uh, you know, but... It is what it is. is You are saying he's a career politician. Yeah. No, he's going to move with what is uh, real possible. And I mean, he has been playing the game of supporting the DA to punish the ANC, to get the ANC to where he wants it. So I believe that that rhythm will uh, play itself out again in the national elections. And, And by the way, he gives these votes for nothing. He is not presenting hard demands for change, transformation, stopping evictions or any of that. No, yeah. he's playing politics. So the 2024 situation is again being going to be determined by politics. He's going to look at what brings him closer to power quicker. And if it is the DA, he'll go with the DA. If the ANC is open for that possibility, he'll go with the, with the ANC. And of course, what this means... That arrangement of 2024 like that, it means that the transformation agenda is taken 50 years backwards. That is the sum um, result of this political realignment. We are not going to see any transformation for another 50 years in our politics because, of course, the black majority is going to be so fragmented that our numbers... (laughs) Also, will not matter. Yeah. Right now, yeah. you know, the only thing that we have is numbers, yeah. but those numbers are not going to matter. Yeah, because of course, there's so many different possibilities: ten percent here, twenty percent there, eleven percent here. And Rob Herzog has got the money, and our politicians need the money, mm. so he'll going to control all the political parties. I mean, already he is controlling the small political parties. Uh, I believe he funds all of them already. 
and um, he has that block that he will use and i think he will instruct the da to go with his block because he's also funding the da so um we are likely to see it small political if the anc gets say 45 percent then a real realignment of politics in this country is going to emerge yeah what do you think is happening with our country though uh, load shedding um water outages and there's now fears of a fuel um shortages as well what's happening uh, is there a force that is trying to create an, a, a very negative situation so that people can revolt? Why? 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 Why would that be the case? Um, this dysfunctionality is functional to capital and is politically functional. Politically functional in the sense that it exposes the ANC, it puts the ANC in a position where nobody's gonna want to vote for it, mm. and therefore strengthening the opposition. On the other hand, it is economically functional in the sense that it gives the state-owned entities to white capital for free, this, cap this crisis. Mm. Um, we've seen already how we sold SAA for 25 rand. They will do the same with ESCOM. They want a real crisis to be perpetuated in that area so that when they sell it to their friends, me and you say, yeah, well, I mean, we are tired of load shedding. Maybe these guys will stop load shedding. Of mm -hmm. course, they will stop it, but we're going to pay to the roof. Yeah. Because once energy is privatized, then they are only going to be looking at the profit margins. Yeah. And, 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 and it's going to be even more expensive than wh what it is. Yeah, just on that point very quickly that the, the one thing that, other pe that people don't realize is that when it's in the power of uh, a private company, um, whenever there are negative business practices that are being investigated on that company, it's possible that they could sabotage us, not allow the availability of electricity. For example, when Mark Zuckerberg was being investigated for selling data of American people to private companies, there was one day where um, he created a scenario of confusion where you couldn't be on WhatsApp and you couldn't be on Facebook for 10 hours. That's the danger that if you give the remote control to one company, uh, the day that you are investigating them um, for their influence in the political space, for the way that they treat their workers, you are giving power to one entity to just do this. And then we don't have power for seven days, for example. Those are the other dangers besides the pricing that you give so much power to one entity or to an oligopoly, two or three companies um, that will be running um, supply of power. And when you investigate, it's like giving them water. You're investigating them, we, the, the population, the country itself does not have availability of water because they are putting pressure on the investigators, um, you know, on the NPA to say, stop investigating us or we won't make the availability of water possible. And I think that those are the other dangers as well, which brings the question of who runs countries really? Because if there is an independent power producer that provides electricity for the whole country, they are running the country. Yeah. They can decide to switch the lights on and off based on whatever they are going through, which is backwards with, with the government, um, with, um, with the tax, uh, the SARS, whatever. Whatever it is that they're not complying with, they can decide. And then they will post, put up a statement to say, um, we, we had a problem, we are working on the problem. It could take seven days. They know exactly what no, they're doing. No, but I mean, that, that scenario already has happened with... Um Escom and um, this company, which um, was bought by the Guptas, which was providing uh, energy. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I yeah. forgot this name. Yes. It, um, I forgot the name now. Sorry. Yes, yes. I also forget the name. But I mean, that company basically, what it said to Escom is we now want to sell you coal. At, I think they said 600 rand away from 150 per ton. Mm. If you don't do this, we'll hit you with load shedding. Mm. And of course, Brian Molefe said, stuff you. And they did hit us with load shedding. But Brian found alternative means to generate that coal. They simply withheld coal as part of a blackmailing mechanism to get more money. 
So you can imagine if they control the totality of energy production, mm. what they can do to determine the political direction of the country. Yeah. It is the most dangerous thing to give individuals so much power, particularly on such life-sustaining uh, means um, in, in, in society, such as energy, such as uh, water, um, such as also, I mean, our capacity to fly now is determined by uh, private hands. Yeah. It, it is emasculating yourself. Absolutely. It is making the state weak. Yeah. It's already weakened. It begs the question of who runs countries because those are basic fundamentals that we need for sustenance, the price of bread, uh, water, electricity, even the ability to travel around, even the access to the to the internet. You can have a government, but it's a pseudo government if they cannot provide those uh, core functions. But where do you think this is going? Shortages of fuel, shortages of water, um, ESCOM. Uh, you were saying that it's a function of capitalism that you yes. We, we our rate this crisis to, yeah. is functional to capital. Yeah, and uh, they're going to mobilize our rage. Um, against these shortages, this crisis, to basically buy all these uh, basic uh, life-sustaining uh, mechanisms mm. on the cheap. Because if the state can't provide water, they're going to say we can provide water. Um, and then they will sell us that water. Mm. Imagine water being determined by private interest. Yeah. Uh, people don't realize that we're going to pay much higher prices for water. Yeah, with flights already to go to Durban. Uh, yes, I it, mean... It was 800 at some point, 700. Yeah. Now, I went there a few weeks ago, it was like 1,500, sometimes 3,000. Yeah. Depending on how late you are booking the yeah. flight. If it's on the yeah. day, it could be as high as 3,000. Uh, yeah, I've seen the Cape Town flights up to 8,000 rand. Yeah, I forgot about Cape Town. So I saw the 8,000, I was like, I, I won't be going home anytime yeah. soon. Yeah, I mean, but precisely, there are, <laughs> once you privatize... The profit motive kicks in. They don't care for service. They care for those margins. Mm. And that's what you're going to pay. But let us let me just uh, reiterate that sure. the crisis that we find today, whether it's water, whether electricity, um, petrol, these crises are functional to the, private, to the profit motive of private capital. Mm -hmm. It works for them. They need it. In this way, they're going to make even more money. And they will buy this stuff at a cheap and control our societies for a very long time. Yeah, we have 10 more minutes before load shedding. Um, I wanted to ask you a very important question. What do you think was happening uh, on the day that President Jacob Zuma, President Thabo Mbeki and uh, uh, former Ketika President, uh, Interim President Khalid Mamutlanti were pronouncing against Cyril Ramaphosa? I have the tendency of saying that just because uh, Rob Hersoff is angry at Sarah Ramaphosa does, and you are angry at Sarah Ramaphosa, it doesn't mean that you have the same reason for being angry. He has his own reasons and you, a poor person, you don't have the same reason. Um, why do you think they went at him? Is um, is there something at play there that three former president pronounced against uh, Sarah Ramaphosa? Of course, on, at face value, something happened at Palafala. Um, he, he, he suspended the public protector who was supposed to investigate him that's on face value that's like abuse of power that the person who's supposed to investigate you you are suspending them but is there anything else that we can infer from that that three former state president pronounced um, around the same time within a 24-hour period against the current sitting president um ramaphosa is on his own uh, he's abandoned by capital rob, rob herzog went against him very hard so, of course, that dovetails with the ideological battle that he has with Zuma. So Zuma is the only authentic um, point of battle against Ramaphosa. Mbeki and Mutlante, I argue, are simply echoing the same sentiment of Stellenbosch. But you can see all these things converge. <laughs> on the same man. Coincidentally. Yes. Uh, Stellenbosch doesn't want this guy. We have we never wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> when I say we, I, I, of course, speak on behalf of the RET forces. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is clear that our interests now converge. 
uh, on 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 Ramaphosa, and and that creates a very dangerous situation because we would assist them to get rid of Ramaphosa, yep. and if we don't have a clear plan, a project, then their project is going to emerge. They have their reason why. Yes, they have the. We are fighting against Ramaphosa for totally different reasons. Yeah, yeah. We want him gone because he represents them. They want him gone because he's failing to move faster uh, and uh, more efficient than their investment. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the, the return on investment is so low with Ramaphosa because he's so inefficient. And now he's been caught with the Palapala Pala project. Uh, he is compromised. Uh, capital can see that this man is likely to lose also in December and so they are they are abandoning him and I think agitating their forces against him and the first uh, person that moved is Rob Herzog as we know and others are simply following and as, as I say unfortunately our position which has been always anti Ramaphosa is now converging with the position of white capital which ones their men gone yeah uh, have you ever pondered the possibility of what a future looks like without President Jacob Zuma? He's in his 70s. Um, he's a spiritual leader of what you call the radical economic transformation fa faction. Um, have you ever pondered? Because every time we are asking ourselves who's battling against Sarah Ramaphosa, um, whoever is being offered, there's always like, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. Like, I think that there is a realistic prospect of a, in 10 years time that either because of age he's no longer coherent um, or because of age of course naturally people when they get to their 80s and 90s would bid them farewell um, what happens beyond that then? because I understand that every single time you speak on platforms um, that is like a, a spiritual leader of the RT faction and you have your reasons you've stated your reasons that as soon as he moved to say um, lend, a, lend a pro expropriation without compensation that's when you could see that there is this pro-black aspect of him that you you bought into. But above and beyond Zuma, um, what does the landscape look like for you? I have not uh, pondered. <laughs> <laughs> beyond, 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 uh, beyond, uh, be, uh, because I think that it is bleak. Uh, he is the organizing force, symbolically and otherwise. His absence, I think, will simply collapse that project completely. I, I can't see, um, you know, Comrade Ace could try, Comrade... You see, if Ace, um, uh, this Comrade from the Northwest, Supra, uh, Supra uh, were moving the same rhythm, maybe they can become some kind of a block. Um, but I think you're going to, and maybe somebody like Lindy were coming into that space, they can generate some kind of a block to pr provide leadership. Um, but without Zuma, honestly, prospects for radical economic transformation are looking very, very big. Even outside the ANC? Yes. Um, right now, politically, the hope for a left shift is dependent on Zuma's presence because of his popularity, because of his clarity, um, and um, because of his capacity to maneuver. Uh, in his absence, no, my friend, I can't see... I can't see much further. <laughs> uh, yes, man. We are here. We are building. We are building. We are building. I'm still young. Uh, I mean, Comrade Andy Lelungisa, for instance, is a very astute... Yeah, but I'm yeah, I mean, this is the thing. The demonization machine cuts down any prospects, um, prospective leader that could possibly emerge. That, that's why I'm saying I can't see further than Zuma, quite frankly, right now. All right. That's uh, Mutam. I hope to invite you again in the, in the coming months. This was a good therapy session. It was one of my first interviews after having pondered what I want to do with this channel. Um, I'm uh, encouraged by you doing content now. <laughs> and I am dragging myself back to the pro-black position. I have an entertainment channel, which is a football channel. 
I I don't have to and, create. And you anymore. guys got got the the, the uh, Sundowns the prediction. Sundowns Pirates prediction horribly wrong. I genuinely believe like <laughs> Sundowns is a strong team. They yeah. they are the strongest team in the country. Yes. And the, the Pirates coach for me, having seen him for four months, there's nothing tactically that I'm seeing, and I'm a trained coach. Um, it's like ah, these guys have a. A very strong team. They have the strongest team than anyone in the country, Mamelodi the Sundowns. I think the reason why they had had to reshuffle is because, and I said to my guys, I said, yo, there's a problem here because there's three different voices and someone wants to have their say and another one. That's why their starting lineups look defragmented. Instead of Anale Jali, who's their best midfielder, they will decide to bench him sometimes, which doesn't make sense. The point is, you guys got the walloped by your followers. <laughs> I don't know that because I, I I don't read comments. So yeah, no, I read the comments almost all of them, and the people were like, "Yeah, we told you, you hate, uh, you know, uh, our Orlando Pirates. You, you apparently you all f- support Sundown supporters. Ah, uh, Sundown is the, is the best team in the country uh, until some. So they've won the league five times in a row. So when you win elections every year, five times in a row, you are the best. Uh, like we could argue that um, Julius Malema is the uh, biggest pol- biggest political personality in the country. And that's I think that's empirically yeah. right. Yeah. That if he has a meeting, yeah. there that's could true. be 50,000 people yeah. coming easily. Yeah. Right. So if I'm on a platform where I'm being asked that question over and over again, that will be my answer until it changes. So Sundowns have won the league five times in a row they're going to win it again, even though they're experiencing some turmoil. They're going to win it again because they have more money than God. That's, yeah. that's a, yeah, money you know, money talks. Yeah, and they have Mutsepe money, so they, they're going to buy the league again. But I mean, I follow you guys. You're doing a great thank job. Thank you. Man. Thank, thank you, you for your kind words as well yes. when you write about us. <laughs> yes. um, Tina, I told my guys, like, don't, don't read comments. And they're not on social media, so they don't read comments. <laughs> no, we keep moving. As long as we can get 200,000 people to watch our content, it's like, ah. We have yeah. a very good business model. No, you're doing... I mean, I will, even if I watch on TV, but when it comes to halftime, yeah. I come to check what you guys are going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> sure, you. Sure. And you've always supported us from the beginning. Yes. Always, always supported us. Uh, my leader, I'm mean, enthused by what you're doing on uh, social media, on, um, on digital media, uh, on Andal Mutama Speaks podcast. Um, and I wish you all the best there. You said you wanted 20,000 20, by December. I said, hey, 10,000. 10, 10,000. Okay. I was like, yeah, this is very. Um, oh, I, I thought it was 20. I was like, yeah, this is very ambitious. But yeah. you are going to get to 20,000 yeah. uh, somewhere in the next 12 months. Yeah. Uh, as long as you continue, uh, you consistently should. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you for in- the invitation. Thank you very much, guys, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Um, don't mind the banter. I know you love your leaders and you don't want them to be asked questions a certain way, but really when I'm familiar with certain people, I'll speak to them a certain way, but it's all within respect. And I thank you very much. If you're still around here on the episode, uh, thank you very much for watching us. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment on our content. Thank you for watching. Boom. Mm-hmm.